Welcome to the Writer's Journey Podcast. I'm Michael Laron, a science fiction and fantasy author on a journey to go from nobody to bestseller, and I'm documenting every step of the way. Tune in every week as I pull back the curtain on my writing life and how I'm building a writing career while working a full-time job, raising a family, and attending law school classes in the evenings. You can find show notes for this week's episode, a free starter library of my fiction, and much more at michaellaron.com. Hello and welcome to episode 120. 120 is a good number. And the name of this episode is 2012, which also happens to contain all of the digits of the number 120. I did not plan that. That was just something I noticed at the very last minute, at the the fraction of a second where I started recording this episode. (laughs) So hope everybody is well and healthy. And I titled the name of this episode 2012 because last week I had mentioned that I was going to do an episode on... 2012 and my near-death experience, mainly because I get people that ask me about it fairly regularly. I've done a video on this, but I figured I haven't done a podcast episode on it. So fair warning that this episode may get a little deep, but you know, it's been a while since I've done one of these episodes, right? So quick announcements. So I had a podcast interview for the first time in a long time, actually. So I had a podcast interview with my friend Dan Blank on his podcast, The Creative Shift Podcast. And Dan and I have a special connection because Dan and I co-hosted a podcast for about two years, the Ask Ally Q&A podcast that I do for the Alliance of Independent Authors. I host that with the Allies director, Orna Ross, right now. But before her, Dan and I ran the show. And so Dan and I really got along really well because Dan has this really fantastic focus on mental health and the spiritual and the emotional side of being a creator that I've always admired and really appreciated. And so on this episode, I got kind of vulnerable and we really... We got really deep, actually. We, we talked about a lot of stuff that I've never talked about before. So I will drop a link to it in the show notes. And part of our conversation is, is what generated my thoughts for this show today. So definitely you want to check this out if you, if you haven't heard any podcast episodes from me lately. Uh, Dan is just a good dude, and um, I would recommend you follow his show as well. So second reminder is a huge thank you to all of you who have signed up so far for the advanced review copies of Your Self-Publishing Questions Answered. Advanced review copies in ebook and audio will be available soon. I may have to push the release of the ARCs back just a little bit to con- to to coincide with some things that we're doing at Ally, but rest assured they are ready and they are coming your way very soon. So if you're on the list, Don't be concerned. And if you have not joined the list, you can do that at authorlevelup.com slash QA advance. You will get a free copy of the book in ebook and audio to listen or read as your heart desires. And if you'd love to leave a review, that would be fantastic as well. So wins for the week. So the audio book is done. So I finally have been able to close that chapter. So um, I it's, I'm actually recording this episode very early this week. It's Saturday as I record this. But the audiobook is done. I delivered it Saturday afternoon. And I've got just a couple of little piddly things that I have to do to the audio between now and the time we publish it. But it's not anything very serious. And it feels really good to shut the lid on that project and move on to something else and start thinking about strategy and and how the rest of my summer is going to go. So um, I hope that everybody that got to listen to the audiobook demo last week, if you happen to listen to that, last week's episode, the last five minutes, was the audiobook edition or a sample of the audiobook. I will release more demos or more samples as we get closer to the launch. So it's kind of a fun fact. So uh, 50 people have joined my ARC list for your self-publishing questions answered, which is a record. <laughs> I know that I'm the king of small numbers sometimes. It's definitely not uh, uh, you know, mega bestseller level uh, engagement, but uh, I'm grateful for each and every one of you, 50 people that have joined that list, and uh, I'm excited to get the book into your hands. And last thing I want to talk about is a win for the week. It's not so much a, a win that I've done, But it is a win, I think, for authors and anyone who wants to format their books in Vellum. I had to think about what I was going to say here for a minute. (laughs) So I happened to be working in Vellum this afternoon, and I got this notification that said, 
a new version of Vellum is available. And the last probably five or six versions of Vellum, they've all been kind of like um, stability updates and things that they added features that I just didn't think were terribly important. But I happened to look, and now Vellum supports internal links. So I think maybe you will recall about two to three weeks ago, I think, I complained about Vellum not supporting internal links when every other formatting app has the ability to do this. And I guarantee you Vellum did not hear a word I said. I, I guarantee you they weren't listening to the show. <laughs> if they were, that's awesome. But, uh, you know, sometimes you send out uh, vibes into the universe and things happen. So Vellum now supports internal links, which is a a huge, huge step forward for the app. Because now what this means is that you can select text and then you can have that text reference and jump the reader to somewhere else in the book. So when they tap that link, they can go to chapter 10 or to chapter two. And what really makes Vellum cool, and, and I, I appreciate the fact that they took the time to do this right, you can actually jump within headers, like subheaders of the chapter. So if you've got the chapter broken into different sections, you can actually jump the reader to the appropriate section that you wanna to go to, which that is much easier to do in Vellum than it is to do in say Microsoft Word because then you got to use the anchors and it's just kind of a pain and they they took the time to do it right. So why I think this is important is because I use internal links quite a bit in my nonfiction and in my interactive fiction. So my very first books were interactive novels and I did those in Scrivener because Scrivener supports internal links. Now this lays the groundwork for me to potentially get back to interactive fiction at some point in the future. And I have the, the first novel that I'm going to do is a sequel to my Festival of Shadows book. So Theo and the Festival of Shadows, I've always wanted to write a sequel to that book, but I didn't want to have to deal with Scribner 3's compile. <laughs> I know that's terrible, and I even know how to use Scribner Compile now, but anyway, um, that means that there will be a sequel to Festival of Shadows at some point. So I'm excited to return to interactive fiction at some point in the future, and very excited about this new feature that Vellum has. So, you know, we just keep making progress, don't we? So, lessons learned. These are just some, some quick lessons here. Uh, for writing lessons, um, I did a video on my YouTube channel on how to write fight scenes. I'm doing a lot of nitty gritty fiction analysis videos over the past few weeks. And I did a, a video on how to write fight scenes. And um, I did a analysis of uh, the Dresden Files book one. And it's if you if you've read it, it's the scene where Harry goes to visit Bianca, the vampire, and he visits her at her mansion. And it's this long drawn out fight scene that's really, really cool and stylistically really worth looking at and, and just super cool of Jim Butcher. So I, I broke that down and kind of studied it. And someone was talking in the comments about how they appreciated the video, but they were talking about how you want to avoid sports broadcasting when you're writing fight scenes. And that was such an eloquent way to put it, if you think about it, because a lot of people, they write fight scenes and it's just a play by play. Oh, Jimmy punched John. John punched Jimmy. Jimmy fell down. Jimmy wiped some blood off of his lip. You know, it's just very declarative sentence-y. <laughs> and if you can avoid that, that's going to do you and your readers a lot of good. So if you haven't watched that video, I will link to it in the show notes. But uh, I thought that comment was very well taken. And business lessons. So something that I've been doing that I, I don't advertise, but I thought, you know, maybe it would be kind of cool to talk about because maybe there's something that someone out there can can gain from this. So you guys know that I have courses and you can purchase those courses on, on Teachable. So you can go to authorlevelup.com slash courses. I've got two courses. I've got a write to market course and then I've got a course on writing in hard times. And one of the things that I've been doing for the past, eight, I don't know, year or so is that anytime someone purchases a course from me, I actually record a personalized video for them. So I address the person by name. I thank them for buying the course and and let them know that if they have any questions, they can email me and I will make sure that it's a priority. And I've been doing that for a long time. And I was looking at all the, the videos that I've sent out and I've got about a 50% response rate. And the people that respond are usually like, holy, holy cow, I would have 
I would have never known that you <laughs> would have recorded a video for me, right? So I don't know. It's just a little touch. Um, it's something I enjoy doing. It's it's kind of a nice surprise that people get in their inbox. Um, I think the other 50% probably don't get it because of spam filters and such. Um, or they get it and they're like, oh, this is, this is cool, but whatever, right? So I don't know. Just thinking about some personalized things that you can do for fans that are easy that are free and to show them that you appreciate them and and you appreciate what they're doing to support you and your platform, I think can go a really long way. Now, copyright lesson. So something I learned, I was uh, in the process of looking looking at uh, permission to use something in one of my future books. And um, the author had a copyright registration and I happened to look it up on copyright.gov. And I happened to notice that the, the author had their their personal contact information in the copyright registration. So you don't always see this, but sometimes you can sometimes you can find that. So in this case I couldn't find the author. So I guess they didn't have a website or whatever, but their copyright registration had a phone number and it had an email address. So I was able to to grab that information in order to find a way to get permission. So just an interesting tip, uh, interesting thing that uh, I can pass along for copyright perspectives. So idea of the week. So my idea of the week this week is something that I hope, I know it's out there, I just don't know of it. And the, that is a comprehensive brand monitoring system that actually works. Actually works being the key word. So for example, if I have a podcast interview somewhere, or if someone mentions me on any social media network, even a network where maybe I'm not even on it, I want an email notification and I want the content of that post in the email. So I don't have to go to the social media network. I want a link to the post in the email. And then I want a link where I can automatically share it with Facebook, with Twitter, with all my social media channels. Um, I just think that would be very helpful. Uh, Google alerts don't work. <laughs> They've never worked for me. Um, there's a, a service that I used to use. It's called TalkWalker, I think. And every once in a blue moon, I'll get an email from them saying that somebody mentioned me somewhere, but there's no real rhyme or reason to it. I just think it would be really cool to have like a social media slash brand slash Google search monitoring system that's super crispy, that works, and you know, you get email reports whenever you want them. Maybe you want them right away. Maybe you want them within 24 hours. Maybe you want them within a week or you want a monthly digest. And I would just love to be able to just within the email, just scan it and then be able to reply to stuff from the email. I just think that would be super, super cool and super clean. Um, Cause one of the things that I always prioritize is um, when people reach out to me, I always make sure to try to give them a response. And so it, it, it breaks my heart sometimes that people are talking about me elsewhere out on the internet and I just don't know about it. Right. So it would just be nice to have that. That's the idea of the week. If anybody knows something like that, feel free to drop me a note, authorlevelup.com slash contact. All right, so topic of the week, 2012. So I mentioned last week, um, I know a lot of you listening probably know this story, know the basics of it. I'll go a little bit deeper into it this week. Um, but I had a near-death experience in 2012, and that is what made me want to become a writer. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that, what my state was in 2012. And then I actually want to take this and relate it to you. At least I hope that it's something that will relate to you. Because the reason I chose to talk about this was not just to share my story, but it it's a way to maybe inspire someone out there listening who maybe needs to hear this message today. Okay. So 2012, let me just set the table for you. 2012, um, I was two years out of college. I worked at a horribly crappy job, and crappy is really being um, being kind. <laughs> the job I worked was I was a claims adjuster. So it was my job to talk to people who had been in car accidents, sometimes horrific car accidents. It was my job to interview all the parties who were involved in the accident. It was my job to get the police report, I got to look at photos of the cars. Sometimes I got to look at the cars. And it was my job to determine who was at fault for a car accident. Now, imagine with me for a moment that you have just been in a car accident and you have a car 
or half a car in some cases, <laughs> and it doesn't work, you can't get to work, you maybe have neck pain or back pain, or maybe you've broken an arm, right? And you've got the stress of trying to figure out how you're going to get your car fixed. You've got the stress of figuring out how you're going to get a rental car. You've got the stress of figuring out who's going to pay for your medical bills. And you don't believe you're at fault because the other guy hit you. All right. And you don't want to use your own insurance. So here I come traipsing along, Michael, Michael, the adjuster. And I give you a call and I say, well, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, for talking to me. I appreciate you sharing your story. I do have to let you know that we've determined that you're at fault for this accident. So therefore, we are not going to be paying for your car. We are not going to be giving you a rental car. We are not going to be paying for your injuries. And by the way, because you because my guy was hurt, we're going to be sending you a bill for all the all of the expenses that they have. <laughs> Can you imagine those conversations? I can't tell you how many times I got cursed out. Um, I had the N-word dropped on me. Um, you would not believe it. And I saw the worst in people. And it every day was giving bad news to people. And I remember walking into the office on Monday mornings. And I would sit down at my desk. And I would get 10, 15 claims before 9 o'clock. And when you get these claims, it's, it's not just a claim like it's it's two or three people you have to call and talk to who need immediate attention now yesterday because they got into a car accident over the weekend so it was a high stress job uh, i got abused quite a bit verbally um, i saw i saw the worst of people but i also saw the best of people if that makes sense there was a lot of really interesting and, and touching things that happened but it was overall a shitty job <laughs> and it didn't pay very well either i mean at this point student loans were half my paycheck and i had a new car and i bought the car new so that was another third of my paycheck and that left gosh i, I don't know how much money i had in my pocket but it wasn't very much, so I wasn't eating very much. I mean, I, I had to buy the cheapest food I could buy, could afford. Um, you know, I wasn't writing anything at this time because I didn't understand what self-publishing was at that point. That what I thought self-publishing was was uh, authors who who didn't get accepted in tradi into traditional publishing, and so therefore they weren't good enough for it. And so I had this really funny. Uh, disdain towards self-publishing writers. I actually did a blog post years ago, um, and I had a, a journal article where I, I wrote this ripping diatribe into self-published authors. This is very true. I wrote this right around this time. So I hated self-published authors at this time, okay, which is hilarious if you know who I am now. So at this point, I was unhappy. I was unfulfilled. I was burdened with debt. I had a very stressful job, and I just was not happy. And I didn't know how I was going to get out of this situation because at the job I was working in, well, I could, I could work my way up the ranks, but all the people I saw looked pretty damn miserable. So it didn't really look like a great career path at that point. And so, um, I just kind of, I felt like I lived my life empty. Like I look back on those years and I, I didn't really understand what was going on. I just kind of floated and drifted and I didn't really have any strategic direction or any strategic focus. Um, for what I wanted in my life at that point. And 2012 comes along, and my wife and I are out at, um, you know, one of the things we, we love to do, she was my girlfriend at the time, but we love to go out to restaurants around Des Moines because Des Moines, um, before COVID-19, had a pretty vibrant restaurant scene, a lot of really cool ethnic restaurants here, and just a lot of, it's just a great restaurant town, Des Moines is. Um, and so we went to a restaurant, and we were vegetarians at the time, and I got a... I think it was like a vegetarian salad or something. I don't remember what it was. It had strawberries in it. Well, that night I fell ill uh, with what I thought was food poisoning. And again, I'll spare you the gastrointestinal details here. But let's just say that I was in a lot of pain. And I went to the doctor and the doctors were concerned. So they admitted me to the hospital. And they treated the, the issue that I had related to this food poisoning. And it was, wasn't a problem. But while I was at the hospital... I picked up another infection. It's, an, it, it's a bacteria that is very prominent in hospitals, and it's called C. diff. And you can look it up. It, it's, it is, before COVID-19, this was an epidemic 
all right? And I imagine it's probably worse now. Um, so I picked this up, and, and the doctors didn't know that that's what I had at the time. They were just treating me, and, and at some point they, they were very dismissive of my symptoms. I had these really, really high fevers, and there was no explanation for it. And it took a friend that I have in another state who was a doctor to talk to me and say, hey, maybe you've got this, you know, this bacteria. And then they tested me for it, and it turns out that I had it. But while I was in the hospital, this was an entire month. You know, I was in the hospital for two weeks, and then I got out. And then I had these really, really high fevers, and so I had to go back into the hospital. And I spent a lot of time on painkillers, and um, all of that time was a blur for me. And um, as I was getting these really, really high fevers, I didn't know if I was going to survive because um, it was... It, it was starting to get to the point where I was dehydrated, um, I wasn't eating, and honestly, I don't know what would have happened to me. And I was I, I read stories after the fact, jumping ahead a little bit, but I read stories after the fact um, of people that had this, this bacteria, and the doctors didn't know it, and they died. And the reason they died is because the doctors neglected them, you know? And um, I, I, looking back on it, I didn't realize how close I was. Um, to potentially dying, you know, and I remember being on on the hospital bed, and I was I was on morphine. Um, I was seeing hallucinations. <laughs> I, I, I there were cheeseburgers that were talking to me because I couldn't eat anything, you know. So I literally there was this cheeseburger that was talking to me. It was it was a problem, and so I was staring at the wall and I, and I, I was just thinking about my life, you know. And this was the first time in a long time where I'd had the opportunity to sit down and really think about what I was doing with my life. And I don't know why, but this image of me being a writer was very vivid in my mind. I just could see myself being a writer. And I swore on that hospital bed that if I got out of this and if I got better, I would become a writer. And I would bend the universe around myself in order to do it. And fortunately for me, I got better, I got well, and right around this time was when I found Joanna Penn. And I started um, consuming all the content she had around self-publishing, and my opinions started to change. And then I found the Alliance of Independent Authors, Ally, and I found a self-published nonprofit organization for self-published writers, and they were promoting ethics and excellence, and all the self-publishing books that I'd seen were crappy, and they were poorly bound and the paperbacks were junk, you know, and they were full of typos. And here was a nonprofit organization teaching people how to reach ethics and excellence in self-publishing. And things started to click, right? And lo and behold, two years later, 18 months later or so, um, right after I got married, um, I published my first book, you know, and the rest is history. And I got to where I am today. And the reason I wanted to talk about this is because 2012 was probably, as I think about it, a very important moment in my life. Well, I know that it was a very important moment in my life, but it was, it was when I stopped being reactive and I started being proactive. In many respects, you know, you think about, uh, the plot of a hero, right? And the midpoint in a novel is where the hero stops being reactive and they're always on their toes and they start figuring out how they can actually beat the villain, right? 2012 was my midpoint, you know? And I think about that. And I still think about, you know, it, it was July was when I got hospitalized. So it was right around this time, you know, uh, of the year, every year, I, I think about it. And I think about how amazing it was that I had that opportunity and that I heard what it was that my life's calling was supposed to be. And not everybody is that lucky, all right? And I've been thinking a lot about 2012 a lot over the past couple of days. And the reason I've been thinking about it, and this is where I, I'd like to start relating it to you, or at least those out there who have the ears to hear what I'm about to say, all right? As I think about 2012, and we are in the middle of this pandemic, what was very clear to me at the beginning of this pandemic, right around March when things started shutting down, 
that's when I started ramping up my content. That's when I started being more vocal and more visible around this topic. And the reason for that is because what I realized at the time was that this moment right now, this pandemic, 2020, is a lot of people's 2012. It, it, it's, it's very similar to what happened to me. And, and, and maybe those people haven't thought about, I don't want to say you, because I don't know what you're going through, right? You listening to this, I don't know if this is resonating with you or not. So I'm not, I, I'm not trying to be condescending and saying, oh, well, you should think about it like this. I'm just simply putting, putting these vibes out there. All right. Just calling it like I see it. A lot of people are going to look back on this pandemic period, and they're going to realize that it was the moment in their life when everything changed. And there are going to be some people who realize this moment for what it is, and that is a seismic shift and a change in the landscape of their lives. And they are going to go from being reactive to being proactive, but they're going to be lost. They may, they're, they're going to feel like they don't know what's going on. And that's my washing machine. I got to apologize for that. I'm ruining the moment on me. <laughs> but they're going to be lost and they're going to need information and they're going to need guidance and they're going to need advice because this is the first time in their lives where maybe they're staring unemployment in the face and they're staring maybe a divorce or hard times that they've that, that, that would have never have been imaginable just five months ago as I record this. But now there's all these people out there that are suddenly in the middle of a desert that they thought was a forest and they're lost and they're thirsty. That's what this is, right? This in many respects is a near-death experience for a lot of people out there who want to learn how to write books and be an author and, and maybe maybe realize that, you know what, this job I'm working is crappy. I'm, I'm, I'm full of debt, but I see a brighter future for myself and I'm going to invest in myself. All right. And I don't want to diminish any of the hard work that I have done from 2012 to 2020. It has not been easy for me. Just like um, I, I know that this path is not easy for many of you listening to this, this episode and to this podcast. I know that many of you are out there struggling. Many of you have probably written a book and it didn't do as well as you thought it would do. Or many of you have written a book and you're on the verge of publishing it and you don't know how it's going to do. And that's causing you anxiety. And on top of all that anxiety, you've got this this damn pandemic <laughs> where it's just ratcheting up all of the emotional and, and I mean, just the the temperature on the world, it just keeps going up and up. And, and, and the media is certainly responsible for that. Right. And everyone around us is tense and we're tense. And so the temperature just keeps going up and up and up and up. But what we have to do is we have to turn our temperature down. We have to focus on what we can control and we have to create this mental shielding around ourselves, right? I talked to, I talked to a psychic once. This is a funny story, okay? But I, I talked to a psychic once, and I was stuck in an elevator with her for a little while. And we were talking, and one of the, and we were talking about, um, like, narcissists. And I asked her, how do you protect yourself against narcissists? Because there were, there were some folks I was dealing with in the workplace that were causing me a little bit of anxiety. And she told me to, to, to imagine mental shielding around yourself. Like imagine the shielding around yourself so that none of the bad vibes that they emit can touch you, right? And, and that always stuck with me. And as I think about this, this is the same thing, right? It's all this anxiety out in the world, we have to create this mental shielding to protect ourselves from it. And we gotta turn that temperature on, our, on the thermostat of our spirit down so that we become less susceptible to all of the emotional swings that are going on in the world. All right, that is that is what I have chosen to do. But what I don't want people to, to hear is that this is an easy path. All right, so this has been a difficult path for me to get to where I am today. And I have had to make some very real and hard choices. And I've had to bear some very real social and financial consequences 
um, in my journey to become not yet, but a best-selling writer. All right. Now, how this started, the, one of the the first thing was the conversation I had with with Dan Blank. Um, that was a conversation we were having. Um, but but I got a, an email from a reader, and uh, the reader was telling me that they were an aspiring writer, and um, this person was a high school student, and they they got their whole life ahead of them, and they want they wanted to be a writer, and they were asking me, I'm going to college in the fall, and I want to be like you. How can I like, what are the things that I should be doing on a daily basis to be a writer? And I thought about the response, and I thought about it, and I, and I gave them what I thought was maybe helpful. I don't know. But as I thought about it more after I sent that email, um, I just have to keep saying how this is not an easy path, right? Like, sometimes when you look at a successful writer, you think, oh, well, they, they've got it easy, you know, or you know, so on and so forth, but it doesn't, you don't realize all the work that they've done. And quite frankly, guys, I, I'm still nowhere near a full-time income as far as writing goes. I would consider myself to be successful just given my platform, given the number of books I've written, um, given the places where I've been featured and the fact that I've been able to speak to crowds of a thousand people, you know, that and, and that is still generating leads and revenue for me today. I consider myself to be successful but I'm not um, what I think people think when they think of successful. And so some of the things that I've had to do, you know, I mean, I had to constantly put myself out there and I constantly had to suffer embarrassment. I mean, especially in the early years. I mean, the first books I published, nobody bought. <laughs> you know, I did. I, I would do blogs and, and social media posts and, you know, it, the only people that would like them were, were my mom and, and maybe a writer friend that I just met yesterday. You know, um, I went all in on Google Plus and that was a disaster. I wrote a book about anthropomorphic vegetables, <laughs> anthropomorphic vegetable terrorists trying to take over the world. I mean, good Lord, you know, and the cover on that was 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 not good. And so um, huge embarrassment for myself as I think about my brand, you know, and I had a blog and I, I blogged with an unoriginal voice. Uh, I did a podcast for a little while, and the audio on that was bad. And I, I didn't have a message. I I knew that I wanted to talk, but I didn't have a message. And so what? How I showed up was not. It just wasn't good, you know. I, it, it's how a lot of people start. But I started a lot of things, and I failed at a lot of things very early on in my career. And Another thing that I failed tremendously at early on was splitting my focus. You know, I was burning the candle at both ends, at all three ends, if there's a three-end candle out there. <laughs> I mean, I, I, was, I was pursuing a career. Um, I had a family. I mean, my wife and I just got married, and um, we were expecting my daughter at the end of 2014, which was also my first year of publishing, and, and that wasn't easy because I wasn't getting much sleep and um, was worried about the success of my books that, that were flopping. And I knew in 2012 or 2014 that I wasn't going to become a full-time writer anytime soon. And I knew it might take me 10 to 15 years, maybe longer, you know? And that's hard to take when you, you've you got your first book out there. And, and it's, it's one thing to say, okay, maybe I'll be successful after 10 books. But it's another thing to say, well, maybe I, I won't be successful until after 10 years. I mean, that's a long time. I mean, it's hard to see that far out. And... I had a lot of fear and uncertainty, you know, not knowing if my books would sell early on, um, if, if the sales that I got would stop. I mean, I was making five, ten dollars a month my first few months. <laughs> and then I went and then my sales dropped to nothing for, I think, three or four months out of 2014. I made zero dollars. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm never going to make another sale again. You know, people are just going to not buy any of my books. And I made a lot of decisions early on out of fear. You know, fear that my sales were going to dry up or fear that, you know, people weren't going to want to read anything that I had to, to write. And so I made a lot of a lot of mistakes uh, early on. And I've talked about a lot of those openly um, on this podcast. So I don't want people to think I'm not going into it. I, I've talked about them. You guys have heard them. You know what I you know what I was going to say. <laughs> and um, just the time commitment. You know, I mean, I had to give up on many, many social aspects of my life because I'm constantly working. You know, I'm constantly working, I'm constantly creating, constantly doing new things, constantly turning on the microphone and creating some sort of content, right? And so in doing that, 
uh, I've had to give up a social life, right? Like I don't like some people like to go out to the bars on the weekends to hang out with their friends, or they like to go over to a neighbor's do a bonfire. I choose not to do those things because I'm working so hard and busting my ass on this writing business, and I've been doing that for the past seven years, and that is a very real consequence of everything that I've been doing is that I really don't have that much of a social life. And not to mention that just this life is just very expensive. You know, I mean, I, I sold everything I owned to publish my first book. Um, I, I've talked on this show very early on in the, in the writer's journey that I talked, uh, I talked about how I, I used to do music. I used to write music. That was my first thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to be a composer. I wanted to, to compose video game music and, and write jazz. And I found out that that just wasn't, that, that wasn't for me. And one of the reasons it wasn't for me is because if you think writing is expensive, <laughs> oh man, being a musician is worse. <laughs> I mean, you got to buy all sorts of things in order to be even be able to, to get music that sounds good, you know, and you got to pay for instruments that, are, and you can't just buy cheap instruments. You got to buy good ones. You got to maintain those instruments. You've got to buy audio equipment. You've got to buy audio software. I mean, and then there's plugins for that software that's very expensive. And so... That was uh, what I what I tried to do before, and I sold all of that stuff. You know, I sold all of it um, for pennies on the dollar, really. I mean, if I think about what I actually got for a lot of that stuff, I sold all that so I could afford publishing my first book, which was a flop in a commercial disaster, right? And then I kept saying to myself internally with every book for that first year that I published, because I published like seven books my first year, I kept thinking to myself, you know, maybe this will be the book you know, as I publish a poetry collection that sells like two copies a year. And I said, oh, maybe this will be the book as I invest all these dollars into my anthropomorphic vegetable series. Oh, well, maybe this will be the book as I write uh, another interactive novel that was ahead of its time that people just weren't interested in. And disaster after disaster, flop after flop, um, I've had far more commercial disasters than I have had successes. In fact, if, a, if I publish a book and it doesn't sell anything, like, I'm immune to it. Like, I, maybe it's like a superpower. I just don't care. <laughs> like, I, I've spent too much, um, too many emotions over uh, a book not selling and, and trying to get the sales up and trying to do all these promos to see if I can goose the algorithms and stuff that I just don't care anymore. Like, I literally do not care. That's why I publish books, the books that I publish. That's why I'm about to publish a book on author income. It's because I do not care <laughs> because I know I, I, I have a vision of, of what I want to do and uh, freedom and, and being able to write what I feel and say what I feel and speak my own truth to power is so much more valuable in many respects than um, sales in the long term um, because all that stuff will come down the road, but it, it, it involves me being true to myself today. All right. And that's an expensive thing to do. It really is. Like, I don't want people to, to think, oh, well, I'll just, you know, not spend any money to be a self-published writer. You have to spend money. I mean, you've, you've got to spend money on your cover designers. You've got to pay good cover designers. You can't pay for crappy cover designers. There's a lot of crappy cover designers out there. There's really only a few good ones. Um, and you've got to pay for good editors. I've learned over the years that some of, some of the editors that I've worked with were maybe not as good as I thought they were. All right. And then you got to pay for a website and you've got to continue to maintain that website. And then you've got overhead expenses, things like book funnel and things like your email marketing service and other things that you have to pay every year in order to continue your business. And over the last seven years, you know, I'll just drop this figure on here. I, mean, I don't know what the exact number is, but I've paid tens of thousands of dollars I and mean, I've paid pyramid scheme levels of investments in all of this. I mean, I look at all the money I've spent on publishing, and I could have put that money into retirement, I could have put it into savings, or I could have put it into just about anything else more prudent. And if Dave Ramsey were to look at my bank account today, he'd punch me in the face and he'd say, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> you know, I, and in and, and seven years, it, it taken me to get to this point, and I spent all this money on my dream, right? And that's why I'm 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 so such an advocate for Ally because 
there are many authors who are in my position spending that same amount of money and giving away their copyrights and they're giving away their dreams when they think that they're investing in things. So it's a lot of money that I've spent over the years and I'm, I'm not going to lie about that, you know, but I've considered it an investment in myself. Now on the outside in, people looking at me, it's another thing I've had to manage. People think I'm crazy. You know, why would you spend all that money to do this? Why would you spend all your time to do this? Why would you give up your social life? Why would you do all of this stuff? Well, it's because, again, I consider it an investment in myself. And that investment is starting to pay off in really unique and interesting ways. You know, I've, I've doubled my sales many years where I've started publishing. So I started off not making very much money, but every year I make more. You know, and so um, I've been fortunate enough to where um, I've been able to pay my family back for uh, most of the money that we spent personally on my dream. And I'm lucky in that regard. A lot of people never reach that point, you know, and it's not easy to get there. And I'm to the point now where I'm making a profit from my writing, where the money that's coming in every month is sustaining the business. And I don't have to worry about investing my own dollars in the business anymore like I did in the first few years. But even now, I'm still not anywhere near a full-time income, but I'm in a much, much better position commercially. But the scary part is that that could end overnight. You know, there could be a change in the algorithms or there could be something that happens where I'm no longer visible and suddenly I don't have income anymore, you know? And so it's this really shaky foundation and that's not easy, you know? And one of the things that my family, my wife and I have always done is, you know, we knew that this is something that I want to do. And so we have been very careful with our budgeting. And like I said, this is, this is hard to do, but really important. And um, my family has made some choices to help make this possible for me. And some of that is uh, the fact that we live frugally. You know, we, we, we don't spend, spend money lavishly. Um, we paid off our, my wife and I, we both paid off our student loans early. Um, we don't own any debt now other than a house. Um, I've diversified my streams of income, not just my writing, but some of the insurance things that I'm doing. And um, we're very intentional about how we handle our budget every year. And um, I've been fortunate that my income continues to grow up. Um, but there could be years where it goes down. You know, that's just how this goes. And so I guess the reason I share all of this to, to kind of bring bring back the bacon <laughs> or to bring home the bacon, so to speak, bring it full circle, is that 2012 was a shift for me. 2020 is also a shift for me, but I'm in a much better position and I am leveraging that and taking advantage of the momentum and the groundwork that I've laid over these seven years. And in many respects, I make it look easy. It's not that easy. But for those of you who are out there right now waking up and realizing that this is your time, just know that you've got a path ahead of you and just know that it's not going to be easy. It's going to be, uh, parts of it are going to be beautiful. Parts of it are going to be messy. Some parts of it are going to be downright ugly. But if this is something that you truly want to do, it is possible. It is absolutely possible. Um, but you just have to be willing to understand what you're getting yourself into. And that's one of the reasons I put so much information, information out there um, for free to help writers is to uh, help them maybe avoid some of the mistakes that I made and also help them avoid getting scammed so that the money you're investing into this business is truly an investment in yourself and not an investment in someone else's platform. So one of the things that I talked about in my interview with Dan Blank, and I'll end the episode with this, is when the state started locking down, I was traveling for business. It was one of the last trips I ever took. <laughs> I don't know when the next time I'm going to stay in a hotel, uh, but I was in a long road trip and I kept thinking to myself, what is my what is my COVID-19 survival story going to be? Because all pandemics come to an end. On that fateful day, when the WHO declares the COVID-19 pandemic to no longer be a pandemic, and the world can finally move on, and we're in a new world, and we don't know what that looks like, and I look back on the last 18 months or year of my life, 
what will my survival story be? What will I tell my five-year-old daughter in 10 years when she's 15 about how my wife and I survived COVID-19? What will I tell writers at conferences when I can start traveling again and speaking again several years from now? what my COVID-19 survival story was, and what is the survival story of the people in my community that I'm trying to help, right? What is your COVID-19 survival story? And this is your opportunity to write your narrative. You write novels. You write stories with characters that go on journeys. Maybe it's time you start thinking about your writer's journey. Thanks for joining me this week. If you enjoyed this episode, you'll enjoy my backlist episodes at michaelaron.com slash podcast. For your free starter library of my favorite novels, join my fan club by visiting michaelaron.com slash fan club. If you're a writer and want to connect with me further, check out my YouTube channel, Author Level Up, for helpful writing advice at authorlevelup.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back next week.